Welcome to the Intel Automotive podcast series. Today I'll be speaking with Joel Hoffman, automotive strategist at Intel, around the Internet of Things and the automotive industry. I'm your host, Brandon Wick. Joel, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. I, I'm, I'm happy to talk about this exciting topic. Joel, a lot of people out there are talking about the Internet of Things. Where does automotive fit within the Internet of Things? You know, there, there's a lot of buzz in the industry and eventually to uh, consumers around the Internet of Things. And, and mostly people think of um, devices that are maybe uh, parts of their everyday life, like a refrigerator or a toaster, or they, they kind of uh, maybe minimize the value of that. But we're in the automotive segment, and we see tremendous opportunity for automotive in the context of the Internet of Things. Uh, we, we see the car as uh, probably one of the largest data generators that any consumer would typically have. Many are unaware of it, but the car produces uh, incredible amounts on the gigabytes of uh, level of data exhaust, sometimes we refer to it, which is otherwise unused. All the uh, different parts of the car are producing information that could be collected together and made into something more purposeful for the vehicle owner, for the, the driver, for the passengers, because it not only brings together everything in the car, the parts of the car, but the consumers or the passengers of the cars. You know, they're bringing their digital lifestyle into the car every time they enter. And whether it's just one person or half a dozen persons, that information is, uh, is useful to improve your lifestyle. We see an architecture kind of emerging from this too. The car is not a thing on the Internet of Things. It's more of a system of systems because it needs to do some of its own intelligence and processing or analytics to decide what information that is present in the car is suitable for going up into the cloud. There was a recent uh, study done, a real life study of about 3,000 cars. Uh, these are safety related experiments that were funded by the government in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And the exhaust the data that was collected was on the order of 420 terabytes during that test period. And only 300 of the cars were putting out data. So it's clear there's a lot of uh, work to be done to filter that down, to identify what's relevant, what's useful, and what needs to be transmitted out into the cloud. Because connectivity, cellular, Wi-Fi, DSRC, whatever it is, is still quite expensive, and uh, you need to use it uh, cautiously. We also think that there's some analytics that have to occur kind of at the edge of the cloud, if you will, someplace closer to the road, because there's uh, decisions that can take place while traveling that are very local to you. The vehicles around you, the signposts, uh, the exits, the lane markers, all this is information on the Internet of Things. So uh, we see a space where the infrastructure along the highways will be more intelligent and will further break down that information to decide how much of that really needs to go to the Internet backbone. And of course, at the cloud, uh, we see the essential nature of an open architecture. An open architecture in the cloud for automotive is important because no single car maker can build a cloud for the Internet of Things and make it useful. And Joel, can you talk a little bit about how the Internet of Things expands beyond just connectivity? It's not just about connectivity, because if it was just about connectivity, there, we already have that today. Most people that are driving their car also have a phone in their pocket, and most of those phones are Internet connected. It's really about the intelligent processing of bringing the information from multiple sources together. Those multiple sources could be useful for uh, navigating your route, identifying uh, upcoming issues that might be in your way, such as traffic or weather, or potentially very near to you, such as vehicles that might be in a collision path to you. And safety is one of the biggest values that you're going to get from the Internet of Things. And in some cases, it will be connectivity, but in many cases, it will be the processing and the calculations that occur because of the big data information that's coming in. So the automakers are collecting all this data. How are they being able to use it to further refine and improve their product offering? 
there's a huge opportunity for monetization at the automaker level. Uh, most of the time, the automaker's primary goal in putting technology into the car is to make their product more attractive to more customers. And at the same time, they have a relationship that they want to maintain with their customer. Through use of the data that comes out of the Internet of Things, each automaker is in a position to obtain more personalized information around their customer base. They may be able to understand what that customer's preferences are and be able to satisfy those preferences through other marketing efforts. Or they may be able to anticipate repair needs or maintenance needs and proactively inform their customer that they have an opportunity for them to either offer a special service, to offer some customized experience that will retain them as a customer. And of course, on the back end of all of that, the more they know about their vehicles that are on the road, the more useful that information becomes in making better products. And better products will help them sell more products. Joel, can you talk a bit about the demand you're seeing in the marketplace for these intelligent vehicles and the ones that are enabled with next generation services? We're seeing an increased demand for intelligent vehicles because the difference between the past generation of, let's say, telematic systems where communications was the focus is very short-sighted. It has uh, limitations for the car makers, and it typically involves uh, subscription models that the customer is uh, not necessarily interested in paying for. By putting more intelligence in the car, applications that are growing, additional applications that are being developed in an open architecture are offering more choices to the customer. You can only imagine if the phones that we use today had only one or two applications and we had to keep those applications, we probably wouldn't be purchasing them at the same rate that we are now. But the availability of a wide range of useful services that constantly is growing is a byproduct of having an intelligent car, and particularly one that has an open architecture for the software. So, Joel, with all this new technology coming into the automobile, it can seem a little bit like the Wild West out there in the marketplace. What are your thoughts about the market and what's required to move things forward? The platform that's needed to enable all of this starts with a robust and yet well-understood and standardized hardware device. The hardware device, of course, can be used for a number of functions in the car. So you need to have an operating environment that's flexible. The uh, operating systems that suit this need are circulating around a Linux uh, software. And Linux, of course, is offered in many, many, many flavors. So an automotive optimized version of that software, for example, uh, the Tizen IVI project that's hosted at the Linux Foundation has become an excellent starting point for that work. And as the software extensions that are automotive specific, uh, such as features that plug into the vehicle bus or communicate with the user or the driver in a driver safe manner by prototyping, you know, applications, uh, human machine interfaces, things like that in a uh, automotive grade fashion are, are essential. And then on top of that, we need a kind of an innovation space. And some of our automakers that we are partnering with have created a working environment for their partners. They provide the, uh, the open platform, both hardware and software, to their potential partners and allow those potential partners to create something that is innovation that eventually could become a useful feature in a production vehicle. It's not a production software system. It's a, it's a proof of concept that illustrates what is possible and determines if it's a you know, marketable uh, characteristic. And then as they uh, separate the, the proof of concept piece of that platform and move it over to a production or a commercial implementation of hardware and software, uh, they can come to the market much more quickly. They don't have to wait until the car is ready to ship out the door to put uh, these interesting applications on it. They can create the applications in advance 
and then introduce them into the vehicle development more in the middle stages of the vehicle. So Joel, what do you see as the future of advanced driving and how does that move us toward autonomous driving? We're looking at the, uh, the future of advanced driving as really kind of the ultimate implementation of the intelligent vehicle. Today, there are many uh, systems on the road that offer you driver assistance or ADAS, you know, unique systems that may keep you in your lane or maybe uh, keep you at a safe distance from the car in front of you. But those systems are not connected together. They are all discrete and separate, and therefore they are limited. But as you go to the intelligent vehicle, you have the opportunity to have more of a central brain that orchestrates all of those bits of information and sensors that are now being installed on vehicles. The, the availability of sensors in vehicles is uh, increasing every single model year. So all that information is additional analytics to perform, which we think eventually is going to enable this vision of an autonomous driving vehicle even though we don't know when exactly that's going to happen. We know it's in the near future because the technology to support that is moving quickly in that direction. So, Joel, you're out there working and talking with people every day around autonomous driving. What's the general sense on autonomous driving and people's comfort level with it? You know, as far as the comfort level with the idea of autonomous driving, I found that it it is all over the map. Uh, people that are really uh, into technology, they can't wait for it to happen. They're excited about it. Uh, people that spend a lot of time commuting or in boring segments of the highway, they can't wait for it to happen. Many people compare uh, the fact that we are already familiar and comfortable with autonomous transportation, such as airplanes that pilot themselves much of the route. But then, of course, there are those on the other side that are concerned that maybe they're going to lose their independence and they're going to somehow be controlled or there's going to be, you know, some uh, lack even of safety as a a result of computerizing all this. So I think that the time that's going to occur before those products are in the market will allow people to settle into somewhat of a middle ground there. And they'll understand that Autonomous driving cars don't necessarily mean that they're cars that don't have people in them or have drivers in them, but there's this slightly challenging part that needs to be worked out about how do we blend the benefits and value of a human driver with the benefits and value of a computerized system that can take over the less interesting or less attractive features of moving your car along the road. Thank you, Joel, and thank you all for listening. Be sure to stay tuned for the next podcast in the series around automotive-grade Linux.